I was attacked with gout a couple days ago in my legs, and so if I find it difficult to stand, I may bring up a chair in a little bit. But so far, I'm good. Happens twice a year. All right, before we begin, let's ask God to be with us. Our Father in heaven, thank you for striving with us sinners. When we have gone off the path, we have done terrible things, uh, not only in your sight, but in the sight of all of heaven. Uh, it's, it would seem to us, if, if we were angels, we would say, you need to fix those people, and you did. You came down, you, you, you sent your son Jesus, not only to die for us, but to live for us. We accept his blood in our lives to cover our sins so that you can see us as holy again. Thank you, Father. Please be with us today and speak the truth to our hearts. Even the truth that is unspoken, may you underline, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. War on Peace is the title. I forgot to tell them an audiovisual. The title for the Sabbath school is War on Peace. And I think I'm out of order because I'm doing lesson two. <laughs> War on Peace. The memory text, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I need some help. Uh, you usually know me <laughs> as someone who gets excited when he speaks the truth. And I think people take that out of context and they think I'm lying or I'm twisting the, the, the reality of the truth and not a lot of speakers speak like I do. So today, I'm gonna try something a little different. If I start to get excited, I want you to do this. Just, just like it's telling me to calm down because I need to speak more you know, I guess monotone or something to be more believable. So just just tell me to calm down if I'm if I'm starting starting to get excited because the truth gets me very excited. And so today I'm going to try, even though I am, not to act like it. <laughs> Ephesians 1:3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That's interesting, right? Paul begins his letter in Ephesians with a majestic thank you note, right? Praising God for the blessings he has poured out. He, uh, how often do we praise God? How often in our lives do we praise God? You know, it, it's really, I don't know why it's a secret, but it has been. I just learned it res recently a couple of years ago that um, when, I, when I praise God openly to in front of people, that he wants to give me more. He wants to bless me more. And, and I don't mean things. I don't, I don't just mean things. I don't just mean financially. Uh, I mean with wisdom, with knowledge, uh, with, with friendships. With, uh, he blesses you when we bless him. And he says here in Ephesians 1.4, 4, before the foundation of the world. That's quite amazing that he was prepared to give us all spiritual blessing, not only before you were born, not only before your grandparents were born, but before Adam and Eve were born. He does this. So Ephesians models two things. Two things it models. One, how to worship God. This is how the book, if you, if you want to understand uh, let's say you're just getting to become a Christian. You just accepted Christ into your life. And I want to know two things. How to worship God. What's the best way to worship God? Ephesians is the book for you. How to worship God and how to praise God. These are the two things. So there's a war on peace in our society today. A war on peace that has, that has come to us by the devil and his imps. And so we want to stand up for peace and safety. Are you teaching today? Yes. 
Who says uh, teaching? Are you teaching today? Yes? Okay, so there is a Spanish Sabbath school if you'd like to go to the youth room. Thank you, I'm so glad you're here. Paul praises God for the fact that he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. God chose us in Christ. In his presence, we are holy and blameless. If we stand in God's presence. Since before the sun began to shine, it has been his strategy that we would be accepted in the beloved. In short, it's God's intention for us to be saved. We're going to talk a little bit about predestination today because there are whole religions that got it wrong. We're going to get it right and we're going to, we're going to use the foundation of Scripture. It was God's intention for you, if it was only you, to be saved. Now, what does it mean to be saved? Does it mean to go to heaven and not have to worry anymore? Well, that's a little bit of it, but that's not everything. This is the problem in Christianity. We think to be saved means to go to heaven. That's not what God sees, right? To be saved is like if, if you're on an ocean and then you get stranded and there's shark-infested waters and you've been out there for 30 days and you don't have a drop of water to drink. And then suddenly a helicopter comes. Salvation is here, I'm saved. My life has been saved. It's the same thing for God. He has saved us, not so that we can go to heaven, but so that we can be reunited with him again. Remember, Adam and Eve broke that relationship. He separated us. Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit in conjunction, brought us back to him. There is a way of escape from destruction. What does the phrase in heavenly places mean? Because here, since the, before the sun began to shine, it has been his strategy that he would be accepted in the beloved. In short, it's God's intention for us to be saved. But as we look at some scriptures here, it's going to mention heavenly places. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1.20. Okay. That's, that's, that's the book for today. Ephesians 1 and verse 20. Anybody have it? Reagan, do you have it in the back? You can speak it. You know, when I'm studying, I get like right to the books uh, when I'm studying, but then I come up here and then the books uh, fail me. Ephesians only has like four chapters in it too. So there I got it. Okay. Ephesians 1 and verse 20 which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So here, where are the heavenly places? In heaven. Yeah, where, where God is. Ephesians 6.12. Let's flip over to there. Ephesians 6.12 says... For we do not wrestle, and you know this probably by heart, with flesh and God, but against powers, against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. So here's a little bit different. Uh, behind the veil that we cannot see, you know, we can only see certain things with our eyes, but we are only, we're, we're only allowed to see in the flesh. We cannot see in the spiritual world, the supernatural world, those things that are going on. And so we need to be able to be close to God so that we can read what's happening, even though we cannot see with our eyes. And Ephesians 6, I think it's 6, 6. Let's see. Not with eye service, 
as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. In Ephesians, the phrase in heavenly places and in the heavens or in heaven point to heaven as a dwelling place of God to the location of spiritual powers. So in heavenly places is God and our help comes from heavenly places and other spirits that are not of heaven anymore war against us. And so we can always call on those from heavenly places where God is to fight on our behalf. Believers have access, it says, believers have access to these heavenly places in the present as the sphere with spiritual blessings are offered through Christ Jesus. And I mean, you can see this in Ephesians 1, 3, what it says. Blessed be the God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. How? Through Christ, in Christ. So you have power. When evil comes up against you, which it does all of us, some of us are more apt to see it coming than others. Many people are blind to it, so they just blindly go along with whatever happens. You don't have to be. If you are in Christ, you are new creature. You're a new creation, a new creature. You, you have new beginnings, and so your eyes are a little bit more open. Maybe you can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see evil based on the surroundings of things going on, just like when the wind blows. You know if a tree is going like this, the wind is blowing, and we don't know how hard it's blowing because of that. You can see that with evil, too. And so if evil comes against you, maybe in the form of a dead relative, then you know how to call on heavenly places and heaven, real heavenly beings and angels to help you. You know how to call on Christ in the name of Christ. What about the walking dead? Ephesians 2.1 talks about it here, the walking dead. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. So there are a lot of zombies out there today. People who are dead in their sin, they don't know it. They can't tell it. They need someone to tell them the truth that Jesus is coming soon. Get ready, but find him first. That's the first step, right, is the great commission to find God so that they can have a savior. Walking dead in trespasses and sins, walking as Satan commanded them. You can see it in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 here. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once constructed ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as all the others. So if we're children of wrath and we're, and we're walking in our own carnal natures, how do we stop? How do we change? How do we turn around, you know, do a complete 180? God and God alone is the only way. If you want your life to be changed, you have to raise your hand to God and say, I'm in, please save me, take me out of here. He is our only salvation. He's the only way out. Now, we may still be here, physically we're still here, but our mind starts to change. As we are involved in scripture and we read every day, you read the words of God who spoke through holy men and who wrote them down, your life will be changed. You will start to bear fruit, they say. That means your character will become better. You used to get angry at things and now you're a little more patient and you become more patient. Um, you used to not talk about God unless you were swearing, you use his name in vain, and now you don't do that anymore because he's a friend of yours. You see, your life begins to change 
once you accept God in your life. So we needed rescuing, and he did it. He rescued us. We're still in Ephesians, and we're looking at Ephesians 1, 7 now. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, y'all aren't helping me. Remember, you're supposed to tell me to calm down. I just, I just caught myself. I was getting excited. You need to tell me to calm down if I start getting that way. <laughs> we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Does God have grace? Is he graceful? So then according to what he has to give, he gives it to us. He gives us that grace. And um, in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, let's look at Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, and what? The forgiveness of sin. It comes through Jesus alone because of his blood. Now, we're, we're going to talk about it, so I want, you to start, I want you to start thinking, because I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to, if you can answer in a little bit, what are other ways the world believes to get to paradise? We're going we're gonna to answer that in a little bit. Um, so now I'm looking for the book of Titus. Titus 2, 13 and 14. This microphone picks up everything, doesn't it? As, it's good for asthmers. <laughs> I don't have it. Does anybody have it? Titus 2, 13 and 14. Yes. He purifies us. And then she read, uh, it makes us a peculiar people. Does that mean we're weird? No, we could be a little bit weird. We are different, right? We walk among the other earth people, because we are from earth, but we're different. Something stands out about us. We don't listen to the same music right, as, as other people do. Uh, we don't drink the same drink that other people do. We don't wear jewelry as the world does. We are a peculiar people set aside, shining with God's glory. And, it, and your actions are different than they used to be. They should be. We should be different than what we were. We were of the world, and now we're not. And no, we don't expect that of brand new Christians because they're changing, they're growing. And so we accept everyone in our church. But ultimately, with the years of being with God, what you wear, what you eat, what you drink, how you act, how you treat other people, changes to be more like Christ, more godly. And this then should be seen by the rest of the world because people think, and this is how the movies are, that you are the way you are and you'll never change. But there's a power within God that moves by the Holy Spirit in us to change us. And this is the peace that everybody wants. When you accept God into your life, there's a peace and safety that comes. And we want to hang on to that. And so we begin to have that relationship with God that keeps it. The Greek word translated redemption, which was read, you can see in Ephesians 1, 7. Oh, let's just read that real quick. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. That Greek word is apolotrosis. 
apolotrosis, originally used for buying a slave's freedom or paying to free someone who was captive, apolotrosis. We have that through Jesus, his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to his riches and grace. Our freedom comes at an extreme cost. We're told through the spirit of prophecy that there were angels that were willing to, to do the work that Jesus had accepted to do. Let me die for them, Jesus. Let, let, me, let me be the one, Michael. And, and he, they said, no, only God could die to redeem us from the disaster that we were in. We have redemption through his blood. So now I'm going to ask you, because the world would have us believe that it doesn't matter, that it doesn't matter if you're Buddhist, if you're Christian, if you're Tao, if you're Catholic, um, that always lead to heaven. I know that, um, well, her name's not coming to me right now. I used to say it too. Everybody loved everything she said. Um, all ways lead to heaven. What are some of those ways that people say lead to heaven? You can just shout them out and I'll say it here so they can hear it in there. What other ways does the world think that you can get to paradise? Anything? What are ways that the world believes you can obtain salvation or get to paradise by doing works yes in fact that's most religions they believe that if you do something to outweigh the bad things that you've done that you'll somehow earn your way to heaven or to paradise yeah what else purgatory okay and so other people will earn your salvation, right? They can pay for you to get out of purgatory if you were bad. So, so these are our, our lies that are per perpetrated by the, the master of all the demons out there. They want us to believe it. Why would they have us believe a lie so that we don't believe the truth? And it keeps us from happiness. It keeps us from the, the truth of salvation. Can you think of any others? No? Okay. Uh, you, you, do you know what Buddhists believe? They believe that um, they, don't, they don't feel any sense. Like, uh, even though like, they don't have to, they believe that. They don't feel like sense. It might be a form of suffering. Okay. So one of the things, right, that Buddhists believe is that you can't kill anything. Like, not a cow, not an insect, none of those things, because a spirit of an ancestor may be have moved into that, right? That's not biblical at all. Uh, another thing, uh, to become a Buddhist, you know, and obtain, um, yeah, what, what, what do they want to obtain, though? The highest level uh, where paradise is, they call it something else? Yeah, the seventh heaven is to get rid of all emotion. You can't feel anything. You don't feel pain. You don't feel love. You don't, if you can get rid of all emotion, then somehow you have obtained that, that seventh heaven of spirituality. The, uh, spiritual exercises to empty your mind. Yeah, to empty your mind. And that's something we should never do, emptying your mind. Yoga, <laughs> I hate to say it because I can't back it up right now, I've only done some study recently, but it's really not good. <laughs> it is a, a form of spiritualism that the devil wants people, the, the yoga practices and everything that they do, he wants to empty your mind. You know your mind can't be emptied. If you empty your mind, that allows something else to take over. Another spirit to take over, right. So when you're in your bed at night and you're trying to sleep, and you're like, if I can just get all this stuff out of my mind, then I'll go to sleep. Well, you're right, but don't get everything out of your mind. Just pick one thing 
to think about, and that will help you go to sleep. You'll be asleep in minutes. Stop thinking about all these things that you got to do, but focus on one thing and let everything else know that they're important. You'll get to them when it's time, but focus on that one thing and you'll go to sleep. Never empty your mind. God has given us a conscience. We are created in his image. You know that you're more powerful than demons. You have the power of God within you. The Holy Spirit works and breathes in you and through you. You do not have to be afraid of evil forces or powers or principalities from hell. To be redeemed is to be a citizen of heaven rather than a slave of the earth or a slave of hell. Have you been redeemed? Yes, you've been redeemed? Then what do you have to worry about? You don't anymore. You are now a citizen of heaven, even though you're, you don't live there yet. And remember, heaven is not really our home. I know I hear it all the time in songs, and I hear people who are tired of this earth because they're tired of sin, that heaven is our home, but I gotta tell you the truth, it's not. This is our home. Now it's a mess. It's a mess. You know, you, did you watch the show, The Lion King? You remember when they got back to that and after the, the hyenas had destroyed everything and Pumbaa says to uh, Simba, you're gonna fight for this? <laughs> yeah, because this is our home. So God is gonna completely wipe it out, just like in that movie, wiped out with fire. And then he's going to replenish the earth again as we get to watch it being recreated. First, though, we're going to go to heaven for a thousand years and we're going to enjoy everything there and all the other planets that are happening there. But then we will come back home to our home and we'll get to watch God recreate it in six days again and then rest on the seventh day. Our freedom comes from an, from an extreme cost, that being the treasure of heaven. I don't know what God the Father and the Holy Spirit would have done if Jesus would have stayed in that grave because he's God. And what he did prove is you can't kill God. You can't destroy the giver of life who gives life to all of us. To be redeemed is to be a citizen of heaven. Note this, carefully that the idea that God paid the price of redemption to Satan is a medieval, not a biblical one. God neither owes nor pays Satan anything because he didn't have to. God paid the cost to redeem us from sin and suffering so that we could be reunited to God. But it wasn't paid to Satan. Satan is a not in charge of anything. He's certainly not in charge of you, your soul, or your family, or this church. Christ takes upon himself the price of our sins, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. In doing this, work of redemption and forgiveness through Christ, God his riches of his grace being lavished upon us. There's a song about him lavishing upon us everything that we have. Isn't it good to be a member of eternity, to be a citizen of heaven? So right now is the incubator. Is that why you say incubator? It's the incubator. It's our responsibility to grow and develop into a citizen of heaven. We have the title right now, we've been saved, but now we must develop in our characters. Every day, we should be getting better and better. If you would have talked to me 20 years ago, you would not have liked me because I was just a, kind of a new, well, 30 years ago, I was a new Christian and I still had a lot of characteristics from my old past. And um, when I became a Christian, my old friends didn't like me anymore. We want the old Philip back, is what they would say. And the new people would say, 
hey, you, you, you can't do this, or you should do better with that. Well, I started getting better at things and, and working with God to change my life. And that's what all of us should be doing, right? Getting better in our characters. Not getting so mad anymore at certain things that would make us mad, but also seeing the world through the eyes of God, not seeing it the way that, that we used to see it. Paul uses three labels for God's plan. And this is the plan against the war on peace. Three labels. Number one, mystery of his will. Number one. Number two, his purpose. So number one is the mystery of his will. Number two is his purpose. And number three is a plan for the fullness of time. Now let's see this in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So do you see it? The mystery of his will, the, his purpose, and the plan for the fullness of excuse me, of time. Those are, the, those are the three things that is the Christ-centered plan, not only to redeem us, but to win peace back for us. This Christ-centered plan was crafted before the foundation of the world, as seen in verse 4 of Ephesians 1, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy, we should be holy and without blame, before him in love. We should be without blame. What does that mean to you when you think about it? Being without blame, being spotless ultimately. I know we're not yet, of course we're still sinners and we're not perfect, but ultimately doesn't he want us to be perfect? Does God want junk in heaven? No, so he's perfecting you day by day, accept it. The trials that come, I know they're heavy, I know they're difficult in your life, but you, you, you just gotta say to yourself, this is God's will, and he's working his perfect will in my life so that ultimately I can be made whole. So uh, it is so broad and it encompasses all time, which is the fullness of time, and all space, all things in heaven, and things on earth are in his control. One more time, three things in God's center plan, the mystery of his will, the pur his purpose, and a plan for the fullness of time. Paul shares the theme that he will weave through the letter. God begins his plan to unify all things rooted in the death, resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Jesus. So, the last, so we're looking at Ephesians, and the last half of Paul's letter opens with a passionate call to unity. Want to read it? Let's look it up. Ephesians 4. Yeah, there are only, well, there's a fifth chapter. There's six chapters, in, but here it, we're opening up the last part of the book in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I'm not going to read it all, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So... I just want to ask you if you are. Are we Seventh-day Adventist Christians walking worthy of the calling that he called us to? And if not, why not? What do we need to do? Shouldn't we be asking ourselves these questions? What more, God, do you want from me? Why not? He gave all. Why shouldn't we? And he himself, in verse 11, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. Was there anything about speaking a tongue that you do not understand? No, no nothing about babbling here. So he, we edify the church with these things that he stated here till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, a perfect person, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
And this is what we should all be, 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 be moving towards to become. Ephesians 1, uh, 15. Let's take a look at this together. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, and then verses 2, 10, I mean chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this is what we were created for, for good works. Um, do you ask yourself when you're at home or when you're driving down the road, um, how can I be a better person? How can I be a person of good works to God so that I can shine for him? The last half of Paul's letter helps us to unify together as people of good works. Paul concludes with the rousing image of the church as a unified army participating with vigor and waging peace in Christ's name. Remember the title is, is a war on peace. And so Christ wants to wage war for peace, to give us peace. If you're wondering how come Philip isn't as excited as he once was, it's because I am trying to stay monotone. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not getting excited today on purpose like I usually do. So living in the praise of his glory in him, this is Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. If you want to look at it with me in your Bibles, Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. In him also we have, tamed, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. Now, I had a friend. It was on another job that I had where uh, we were sitting in a government vehicle because I used to work for the government, the federal government, and he was one of these predestined guys because uh, he got in an accident a couple years before this and his partner died in the accident. So he was trying to tell me uh, about predestined, that uh, if, you, if you love God, then it's because you're only predestined to do so. And those people who die and get burned in hellfire, uh, they were not predestined to do it. So it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, God predestines everyone. But is that what the text is saying? So all humanity, if we look at it, I'm going to say what I think it is, and then I'm going to read it again. All humanity, oh, let me calm down. I'm sorry, I'm starting to get excited. All humanity was predestined. Now let's read that again in Ephesians 1.11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. What does it say to you? Does it say only certain people are predestined? No, all are predestined. All of us are supposed to obtain glory. All of us have that option of salvation. Every one of us. Now what happens is you've been predestined, all of us have been predestined, and you say, I don't want it. Then you don't have to have it. See, that's the great thing about God is he doesn't force his will. His will, because he loves you so much, is for you to be with him forever, wherever he is, not just heaven, even here on earth, he's going to make this his home. This is going to be heaven. This place, right, this planet that we're on is ultimately going to be heaven. Okay, I started to get hyper again. Okay, so, so I'll keep it calm. You guys are supposed to tell me if I'm getting out, you know, if I'm getting too excitable, just, just do this, and that tells me to calm down. So, so the believers in Ephesus seem to have lost heart. They lost heart. Believers are not victims of haphazard, arbitrary decisions by various deities or astral powers like they would have you believe in other religions. 
They are the children of God. Ephesians 1.5. Ephesians 1.5. Having predestined us to the adoption of his son by Jesus Christ himself, they are his children. And it is God's purpose, counsel, and will. You can see that in verse 11. In him, we also obtained an inheritance being predestined according to his purpose, to his will. You see that in that verse? So um, our lives are not controlled by other deities out there like they would have you see in the movies, which comes from Greek mythology. Our lives are in the hands of God. When you accept him and the salvation that heaven brings, you are in the hands of God without worry. And it's hard once we become adults, very hard, because now all of a sudden you got to pay for everything. And things are very expensive, and they keep getting more expensive. And I say to myself, honey, how are we going to do this? <laughs> uh, and so you start to worry, thinking that you're in charge, that you're in control. If I worry a little bit more, does that make things better? If, 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 I, if, I, if, I, if, if I can't sleep at night, does that make things better for me the next day? No, so dispense with all the worry. We don't have to be worried. God's our daddy, and dad's in charge. We don't have to be concerned about these things. But my car's about to break down. Tell dad. But my job, I'm about to lose it. Tell dad. What a, I lost something. Tell dad. My marriage is on the rocks. Tell dad. No matter what the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No matter what the problem, tell the Heavenly Father, and He will help you through everything, anything and everything. He's there for us. We are His children. How much would you care for your children if they were distraught? You'd bring them back home. Don't worry about it, son. Don't worry about it, daughter. I got you covered. I'll take care of you. You need a place to stay? You stay here as long as you need to. God loves us so much more. Their lives, our lives, should shout the message of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, in him where we have obtained all these wonderful things by his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. What should we do? praise him for what his glory do we praise him enough now he can't love us anymore but he certainly can give us more right dad's got big wallet he's got big pockets and so he can provide more for you that you don't even know i mean there are spiritual blessings that you don't know about Yes, financial blessings. Yes, spiritual blessings. But there's so much that we don't even know in front of us that God wants to give us, but he's waiting. What's he waiting for? God, why are you waiting? Bless me. Bless him. Something happens in your soul when you praise God. I don't know if you've seen it or not. And, 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 and it's kind of laced in throughout Scripture. It's there, but you have to find it. It's blessing God. When you thank God for, for what he just did or what he's going to do, then things change in your life. They change you forever. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the day you were saved. Do you remember that day when you were saved and you were full of that blessing of salvation and your life was going to be new and different and vigorous forever? Now that you are saved, and it's been years, it's been years since that time. Do you want to feel like that again? Praise God. Praise God for what he's doing in your life, and you'll start to begin to feel like that again. It's just a secret I wanted you to know, and I don't know why it's a secret, but, I, but we should know it. In the 80s, we watched um, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. I don't know if you remember watching that. You know, in the 80s, your TV could get maybe two or three channels on certain days, and you might have had to get up there with a tin foil and put that on the rabbit ears 
<laughs> in order to make it. Hold it right there, son. <laughs> and that's how we watched our shows. But the lifestyles of the rich and famous was a show that showed the richest mansions, boats, cars, everything on earth, lavished foods, those kind of things. And we dreamed as we watched that show. Maybe one day I could have that, right? But as Christians, we know that we will have those things. We don't have to have them here. If we have them here and we fight tooth and nail in order to get riches and fame and glory here or sell our soul to the devil in order to get it, then that's it, right? If you have it here on earth, that could be it for you because there's no heaven to gain afterwards. I'm not saying, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that those people who are wealthy are evil by any means, but some are. But I'm not saying that they are. Just because you have a lot of money doesn't make you a bad person. If it wasn't for people who had a lot of money, there would be a lot of other people without a job. <laughs> so there are good things with people who make a lot of money. But I am saying this, where should our heart be? Where should our heart be? Anybody want to answer? Where is your heart? Where should, should it be on things of this earth? Then where should it be? In heaven, right? That's where our heart is. You should know in your mind's eye, in your spiritual mind, that, that heaven is cheap enough. The things that are in your life that shouldn't be a part of your life, it's okay. You can let them go. You can let them go. I know that it's a salve to help you in times of trouble, but that's not real. It's just glitter, and it goes away fast. The truth is that God wants to give you a salve that will last forever and then put you in an eternal inheritance that will be there forever. You will be rich beyond your wildest dreams. In fact, you'll be so rich that gold will be your walkway in front of your house. <laughs> If you're walking on gold, so what? Why, why gold? Because it's soft. It's malleable. Your feet will, won't hurt. you got gold and then you've got some grass. And Ella White describes a grass uh, when the wind blows, a soft blow, it turns between silver and green and blue. That's beautiful. Wow, my mind can only imagine. Have you ever received an inheritance as a result of someone's death? Perhaps a relative left you a valuable treasure or a considerable sum of money. In Paul's view, by virtue of the death of Jesus, Christians have received an inheritance from God and become an inheritance to God. This is how much God loves you. You are his inheritance. He bought you. You are his inheritance. In him, we have become in inheritance. So when God thinks about you, his eyes sparkle because he wants you with him forever. You are his, and he's so grateful to have you. But you can be a bratty child and say, I don't want that. I'm going to do it my own way. It's up to you. So his eyes sparkle in thinking, man, this person, he's, he's going to be up here if he just stays with me long enough. He'll be so close to me. He'll be so peaceful, be, have, 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 have no worries. He'll fret for nothing. Something bad happens, he'll understand. Like Job, right? Ultimately, he understood when God spoke to him directly. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you trusted after you heard the word of truth. So we're gonna, these are the stages that Paul takes us through in... Um, in your conversion story, in your conversion story. Here in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. So in him, you also trusted. So what happened? You did what? What does it say? Anybody? In him, you trusted. Right. Come on. You're with me, right? You're, with, you're still dreaming about heaven. <laughs> you trusted. But first, you had to do something. It says, after you heard the word of life. So the real thing is first, you hear it. Somebody told you, or you heard it. You saw it online. 
You heard it. You witnessed it. You went to a meeting. Something happened, and then you began to trust. And then the third thing, uh, 13, in whom, okay, the, the gospel of salvation in whom also having believed. So then the third thing is you believed. You trust and you believe. You know the difference between trust and believe? Trust, I, I trust something, but uh, I'm not for sure. If it, believing means it becomes part of you. It means I'm, I'm going to believe it and it's going to become a part of me. I'm going to do it. Because you can trust something is real and just leave it alone. But when you believe something, is it's part of you. You're going to do something about it. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. 14. So, And this is the fifth thing in, in the steps to salvation. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased, purchased possession to the praise of his glory? So what's that last step in the... And it's one we forget about, and that's why I called it a secret earlier. What is it that we should be doing in our salvation? Praising God. We praise Him. Praise Him for His glory. Praise Him openly. Praise Him quietly. But praise Him. And watch your life become so much better, so much fuller. The presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives marks believers as belonging to God and conveys God's promise to protect them. They have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. They've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Does... Hmm. There was something I don't want to say. Anymore. Okay, I might want to hear. Let's talk about it. What does that sealing mean, the sealing of the Holy Spirit? What does that mean in your, personally in your own life? Does it mean that you stay the same as you were? Did God seal evil? No. Did he seal you as an angry person? No. He's changing you. Now, he sealed you for eternity, but does that mean he stops working in your life? No. So things should be changing in your life. Yesterday you eat meat, now you don't eat it anymore. Yesterday you wore jewelry, now you see that it's, it's insignificant anymore. Yesterday you drank alcohol, today it's not of God because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yesterday you sat around and just watched movies, now you exercise a little bit and you do other things. To, your life changes because you're sealed and you're becoming a better person. Everything in your life changes, not just those things, but emotionally and spiritually your life changes, right? And then when this happens, then you become a person uh, full, of, full of grace who helps others, can also see where that grace comes from. People will want to know, why are you like that? Because you're different than other people that they know. Why are you so calm in the face of angry people or in the face of danger? Danger's coming and you're all calm and put together. What are you going to tell them? Because my dad's got it covered, <laughs> right? My heavenly father has got me. I don't have to worry. It's all in his hands. Paul plainly states that at the moment one gives his or her life to Jesus and believes in him, the Holy Spirit seals. And the word for seal in Greek is saparagizo, saparagizo, that believers in Christ for the day of redemption. You're sealed for the day of redemption. You're sealed for that day when Jesus comes in the sky. Can you? Can you almost see it when Jesus comes? Is it, is it going to be a secret when Jesus comes? What's, who is he going to come with? What are those? Those clouds are angels. All of heaven is poured out. And this, it will just look like clouds covering. And no matter where you are, you could be in the jungle in Brazil. You could be at the tower in Paris. You could be here in McAllen, Texas. No matter where you are, every eye will see him. Not only that, if you can't see, if you're blind, something else. You're going to hear it, right? At the last trumpet is going to be loud. Doo, 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 
I don't know how it's going to sound, but it's going to be loud and it's going to shake the whole world. And those people who are like, I don't want to see it. I don't want him to come. I'm not ready. They're going to be hiding. They're going to be going to the mountains, asking the rocks to fall on them. To hide, not just to hide them, to kill them because they can't stand the presence of God. But us, we can more than stand it. We're welcoming it, right? Can't wait till my feet lift off the ground. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all I have. So re remember that there's a war on peace right now. And for us to be able to be winners of that war, hold on to God's hand. Don't let him go. And stay peaceful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're asking that regardless of what happens in our life, that we can remain at peace because you give it to us. We don't have to be worried because you take care of us. No matter what's happening, you provide. We praise and we worship you forever. In Jesus' name.